This is Revolution at Sea with John Curtis Perry. Episode 14, Britain versus France. In our journey through time and space, we now focus on Britain as England becomes versus France, two world powers. That is, two states with global interests locked, it seems, in perpetual if intermittent combat that would last for more than a century. The major players in early modern Europe, 1500 to 1800, say, accepted warfare as part of life, but it was seasonal and professional, not total. It could be endured. Towards the end of that period, which extended from 1688 to 1815, Europe was at war incessantly, and conflict spread globally, although mostly waged in Europe itself. By the early 18th century, dynastic and multinational Austria and Russia, as well as France, emerge as major European continental powers. But no one state was able to dominate the continent. During that 18th century, the major powers on the seas were three, Britain, France, and Spain, a weaker third. Despite British preeminence, no one power was able to rule the seas, even in European home waters. Navies could not control large spaces. They lacked communications to do so. Nonetheless, they had global reach, at least potentially. Wherever blue water was to be found, so gunned warships could sail. An increasing knowledge of the world ocean abetted an ever-growing range of action. Navies gave armies new mobility, making it possible for Europeans to fight on the shores of Egypt, in the Ohio Valley, on the plains of Bengal, but no non-European state maintained a fleet of other than minor regional importance. The Ottoman Turks never anchored a fleet in the Thames. No Chinese man junks sailed European waters. No non-Atlantic power, even in its home waters, maintained a large permanent naval force with its sophisticated administrative and logistical support apparatus. And in Europe, increasingly only great powers could afford navies. Spain was written off after the Armada fiasco, but not only did the Spaniards rebuild their fleet rapidly, they also still held an immense territorial empire. Spain and Britain had the largest European overseas empires and Spanish warships remained an important presence in South America and the Western Mediterranean. Spain was spending 20% of the government budget on the navy. It was untested in battle, perhaps, but in the European balance of power, it was important as a fleet in being. It had to be taken into account. In this long 18th century, Stretching over until 1815, the central dynamic emerged as a new series of wars of Britain against France, with Spain as a secondary presence. Catholicism and dynastic ties linked the latter two powers. The French Bourbons succeeded the Habsburgs on the Spanish throne, where the highly inbred Habsburgs had died out. After all, if you married your niece, you could expect that your children might be a bit strange. Royal portraits by Velázquez and Goya are revelatory. And remember that the character and ability of the ruler is significant in a monarchical state. Both Bourbon powers, France and Spain, maintained active naval building programs and seemed ready to challenge the British. But their uh, battle fleets rarely ventured out to sea only for specific missions, both engaged in commerce raiding, but the British, using convoys, 
were able to keep the trade routes open. Britain achieved the objective of homeland security. No invasion occurred. Furthermore, the Royal Navy played a role that was not merely passive or defensive. It could blockade the continent and practice successful economic warfare. North America was one sphere of combat in the global struggle. The British and French both held colonial settlements in North America. Both began with fishing on the Grand Banks. British America grew rapidly in population and became a great market for British goods. French America, less populous, lay farther to the north, therefore it was less suited to productive farming. The French centered on the St. Lawrence River, which was originally thought to be a possible sea route to Asia. New France relied on fur trade, helped by Native Americans, and it became dependent for foodstuffs on its rival. Thus, French America was vulnerable to British takeover in 1763. At the end of the 18th century, the 13 American colonies successfully break away from Britain with the help of France. The French role in the American Revolution was one of France's rather few oceanic successes. France herself then erupts in revolution, exhibiting enormous new energies, entering into extraordinary intellectual and political ferment, articulating a political philosophy that was radical and threatening to monarchical authority everywhere. This provoked political action and protracted war with Britain from 1792 to 1815. In the Atlantic world, an ideological struggle now raged, but it was political, not theological, and it added to an already existing mercantile imperial rivalry. In this competition, England took on new strategic strength. The nation in the early 18th century improves its strategic position greatly by acquiring new assets. First, by becoming Britain. The Act of Union with Scotland in 1707 consolidates state power over the entire island, removing the threat of a hostile French-backed Catholic polity to the north. The British settle Northern Ireland with Protestant lowland Scots, loyal to the Protestant monarchy, and they quell Southern Ireland, thus unifying the British archipelago, although the Irish, of course, remain disaffected. Union was not only political but economic, creating an internal common market. A second asset was dynastic. The House of Hanover solved the problem of dynastic succession. Not much is to be said in praise of a succession of stout, dull, not overly bright monarchs who spoke English not at all or with heavy German accents. They were certainly less flamboyant but more fertile than Tudors or Stuarts, and they were safely Protestant. For those two reasons, Hanoverians provide the nation with a new stability, hence security. Furthermore, the Hanoverians, being non-charismatic, were unable to prevent incremental development of representative government, with public opinion finding voice in new newspapers and coffee houses, where people gathered to share the news and exchange commercial information. Edward Lloyd's Coffee House would spawn Lloyd's of London of great importance to the shipping industry. A third change would be the expansion of agrarian and commercial economies generating capital. Britain became rich even before spearheading the Industrial Revolution. Raising money and spending it generates an upward spiral a bellows fanning the fires of the economy. 
Britain undergoes what we would call a financial revolution with fundamental changes in the methods of state finance, establishing an efficient system of government credit, founding the Bank of England in 1694. In essence, the close control of revenue and expenditure by the Treasury enables maintaining a permanent national debt, resting securely on public confidence. The British state acquires the capacity to raise vast sums at short notice and at relatively low interest rates. This would be an immense advantage for Britain in international affairs. It would pay for an aggressive policy. The House of Commons was willing to spend the money, and the taxpayers acquiesced. Taxes were indirect and inconspicuous. No income tax existed. Thus, a large continuing income stream made a powerful and expensive navy possible. The Royal Navy was the single largest consumer of tax revenue, but most of that money was spent at home. The plowboy tilling the fields of East Anglia or the serving wench in a Nottingham tavern undoubtedly cared little about power at sea for maintaining peace or waging war. They didn't even know what sea power was, but decision-makers had long seen it as a bulwark of religious freedom. Protestantism required a fleet. The fleet provided political security, removing fear of invasion, and many people appreciated the value of using the ocean as a source of increasing material prosperity through foreign trade. They perceived seaborne commerce as generating capital for consumption and protection, prosperity and defense. Imported raw materials increasingly provide employment in processing for the market, both at home and abroad. Despite war, or because of it, 1780 to 1800 sees a rapid growth of British world trade, a rate feverish compared with the past. Growing prosperity creates markets. Sugar, for example, already nurturing the notorious British sweet tooth. By 1800, British sugar consumption was ten times that of France. Tea would replace gin as a cheap drink with big positive impact, but it tended to be loaded with sugar. Other new products, chocolate, coffee, and tobacco, appeared. All were popular with social, even political consequences. All were imported. All were addictive. All were largely products of exploited often slave labor. Glucose, caffeine, and nicotine provided 18th century uppers, not to mention opium, widely used for both medicinal and recreational purposes, and widely available even in bookstores. All these seaborne substances were life-shaping, if not life-changing. Exploration and discovery continued, and the British take an increasing role in creating new oceanic pathways. Maritime Europe stretches its reach and embraces the globe with new oceanic pathways and the instruments of power at sea. And so this is where we shall be heading next in episode 15. Revolution at Sea is written and spoken by John Curtis Perry, with additional voicing by Jamie Rosenberg. Recording by 1623 Studios, Gloucester, Massachusetts. Production and distribution by Albert Buichadé-Ferré. Goodbye until next time.